All right. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kristen Jamerson, and I am the Outreach Coordinator for South Florida Wildlife Center. For those of you that are not familiar, South Florida Wildlife Center is a wildlife hospital in Fort Lauderdale, and our goal is to rescue and rehabilitate sick and injured wildlife so we can release them back out into the wild once they're healthy. We also work to educate the community about how each of us can peacefully coexist with our wild neighbors. So every month we do host a virtual wild lecture series where we bring in different speakers from conservation organizations throughout the state. And today we're really excited to introduce Meredith Heather to you guys. Um, she is a researcher at Archbold Biological Station and she has been doing a study with Florida scrub jay and how their habitat habitat influences them. Um, so I am going to pass over the controls to her. Uh, I also am going to mention that today is National Bird Day, so we're really excited that she is here with us to talk all about this awesome species. So let me go ahead and pass everything over to you, and then you will be able to share your screen, and we can get started. That looks good. Yeah, you're good. Okay. All right, thank you everyone for tuning in to my presentation. Today, I'm gonna to be talking about how we use drones to measure habitat structure and how this structure influences the behavior of Florida scrub jays. So I'm Meredith. Um, I currently am a research assistant at Archbold Biological Station. I've been working here for about five years. Um, I also recently graduated with my master's from Florida Gulf Coast University um, with environmental science, and I did my thesis research at Archbold, so that's what I'm going to be talking about today. I'd first like to thank a bunch of people that helped make this project possible, um, especially my thesis committee, Dr. Reed Bowman, who I work with at Archbold. Dr. Carol Lefebvre and Dr. Brian Bavard, who are at Florida Gulf Coast University. A uh, special thanks to Archbold for hosting me and my study and the Avian Ecology Lab and everyone who's come through there um, for their tremendous support, um, especially the GIS and Data Lab, Viv Slaughter and Julie Sorfley for all their help with the drone data and GIS mapping. Um, and a special thank you to Dr. Evan Broadbent and his Gator Eye Lab at University of Florida for being my collaborators. And various funding sources at FGCU, AFO, and WOS who made this study possible. So I'll start out by introducing Florida scrub jays for those of you that may be unfamiliar with them. These scrub jays are endemic to Florida, which means they aren't found anywhere else outside of the state. They are cooperative breeders, which means they live in family groups, and these groups consist of a breeding pair and often a few helpers. They don't always have to have helpers, and they can have more than three, but typically they have a few of these helpers that stick around. So these are young from previous years that helps their parents. So they stay with their parents for a couple years and help defend their territories, possibly grow their territories, raise their younger siblings, and they often stick around until a breeding vacancy becomes available because nearly all suitable habitat is already occupied. Scrub jays are an umbrella species, which means that by protecting them, you're also helping to protect a lot of other species that share their habitat. They're also a threatened species, largely due to habitat loss. As you can see by this map on the left, their current range is in that darker blue. So you can see that they've already lost about 90% of their historic range, um, largely due to habitat loss. So they are reliant on conservation and management. And it's important to get this management right um, on small reserves for them to be able to persist. So they are a good study species for habitat use because they're non-migratory. And when they do move, they don't go very far, typically only a couple territories away. They defend their territories year round. So each family group will defend um, one territory. So with this um, territory boundaries and being a habitat specialist, 
Um, they really rely on that habitat that they have within their territories for nesting cover and food. So I'll give a little bit of a background on Archibald Biological Station for those of you that don't know it. Um, we are located in South Central Florida. Um, there are other sites that we work at, including Avon Park Air Force Range and Buck Island Ranch. But today I'll be focusing on what we consider to be the main station, which is where Archibald began. And this consists of over 5,000 acres of protected land. So this consists of ancient sand dunes and pristine scrub. Um, Archbold is a really great collaborative environment to work in. So we have different labs. Um, I'm currently involved in the avian ecology program, but we have other programs such as plant ecology, herpetology, land management, restoration, predator prey programs. Um, and we have a really great intern program for all of those labs. So I have our website posted at the end of this presentation if anyone is interested in learning more about Archbold or those intern programs. So the Avon Ecology program specifically has been studying scrub jays for over 50 years. It's one of the longest running continuous banded bird studies in the world. Um, so we currently have about 120 scrub jay families and Archbold has really great scrub that maintains around carrying capacity. Every bird here is color banded. So we know each individual scrub jay just by sight. Um, and we've been studying them for so long um, that we know about 15 generations of lineage. So we know each bird, their parents, their grandparents, their great grandparents. So it's, it's a really awesome study. Um, these birds are also acclimated to being observed by us. So they're easy to watch, which makes them a really great study species for seeing how they utilize their habitat. So what is Florida scrub? Um, there are different scrub associations, and these are based on minor changes in elevation in plant species and soil drainage. But the ones that I focus on today, which are the most relevant for scrub jays, are what we consider oak scrub and scrubby flatwoods. But moving forward, I'll just be referring to this as scrub. So in this habitat um, for the scrubby flatwoods and oak scrub, um, most plants are shorter than two meters tall when properly maintained by fire. So now we'll jump into why structure is important. Um, so habitat in general is a range of conditions that animals need to survive. And structure is also important across a variety of taxa, but it's harder to define because it differs between studies. Um, for example, foraging insects like spiders require vegetative structure to build webs and catch food. Um, small mammals like rodents and these lemurs um, require different structure for overwinter survival or diversity. Um, and a lot of fish require different coral structures for food and cover. So it really depends on the objectives of your study is how you describe structure. Um, for this instance, we are referring to the vegetation height when we refer to structure. Specifically in avian ecology, structure is important for driving species diversity. It's important for nest site selection and reproductive success. Um, it determines how birds move, how they forage, and the types of insects that they can capture and also for predatory defense. Um, it provides cover, but also allows them to um, detect predators. It's been suggested that structure, physical structure of plants is more important than the actual species diversity of plants. And we also know that natural and human disturbances can create variation within habitats um, for this study specifically, we're focusing on how fire influences that structure within scrub jade territory. So Florida is the lightning strike capital of the US. Um, historically, these wildfires that were started by lightning strikes were unimpeded, um, creating structural variation across a large area. But now land managers must maintain variation in small reserves um, because as urban development grows, so does fire suppression. So these land managers are 
are now forced to work on a fine scale level. Um, so this can create more fine scale patchiness, especially within scrub bay territories. So as you can see in this graph, um, jays prefer this optimal habitat, which is between like two and 10 years post fire. So when you have a fire event, um, it kind of resets the vegetation. And then as that vegetation starts to get taller, about 10 years post fire, the jays start to decline in the area. And after about 20 years post fire, that vegetation has become too tall and the jays abandon. So larger territories are more likely to have more of this optimal habitat. And we know that this leads to increased survival and reproductive success. Whereas jays on smaller territories are more likely to experience a larger fire that can burn homogeneously, leaving them with this kind of barren landscape. So Archibald does um, perform prescribed burning. <coughs> Um, so we historically used time since fire and other fire metrics as a surrogate for defining structure, but fires burn unpredictable, um, so it may not be the most accurate. So the objectives of this study were to test the gator eye lidar in Florida scrub within these scrub jay territories and to understand the links between fire, habitat structure, and habitat use by scrub jays. Previous field methods to measuring habitat structure come with challenges and limitations. They're often plot-based or based on transects, so you have limited spatial extents, um, which can lead to inaccurate data when you extrapolate that to an entire landscape. They also take a lot of time and effort. Like I can imagine if I had to manually measure all the vegetation across my study site, I would still be working on this project. Compared to drones, which are becoming a lot more popular in ecology, um, and they continue to have advancements in their technology, they can be used for a wide variety of studies from censusing large mammals in Africa to monitoring marine mammals like whales, um, even going underwater to map coral reefs. So the, the drones can increase your monitoring effort. Um, they can increase your accessibility to possibly habitats that are more difficult to get to or sensitive or remote areas. They can increase the area covered and they have a wide variety of sensors and cameras. They also help reduce cost and decrease your time spent in the field and reduce disturbance to sensitive wildlife areas. So for this study, I used the Gator Eye um, Unmanned Flying Laboratory drone um, it's out of University of Florida, the Spatial Ecology and Conservation Lab. So special thanks to Dr. Evan Broadbent and Angelica Zambrano for their collaboration and development of this drone. This drone is super fancy. Um, it incorporates all these different kinds of sensors and it can provide a suite of over 50 ecological metrics. So it's pretty amazing. Um, for this study, we just focused on the LIDAR. So for my research questions, I'm just gonna focus on these first two first, and then we'll get into the third one in a little bit. So I looked at how fire explains variation in habitat structure within jade territories, predicting that more fires and fire patches will lead to a higher structural diversity. And also that structural diversity may correlate with time since fire or fire return intervals, which are common metrics we gather at Archibald. And does increased territory size provide more suitable habitat, predicting that larger territories will have more fire patches, which will lead to greater structural variation. So for the drone, um, we flew the gator, the gator eye over the archfold. Um, so it was pretty awesome. It flew 450 acres in a single day, which is very impressive. And so we collected 3D LIDAR imagery um, so LIDAR uses lasers, so it shoots these lasers down to the ground and kind of hits all those layers until it reaches the ground and then uh, measures the time that it takes for those lasers to bounce back up to the receiver. And that's how it produces that 3D image that you can see down here on the bottom left. So we collected habitat structure data at a submeter scale for 29 scrub jay territories. And then this data was aggregated to calculate a mean canopy height at a 30 meter resolution. 
which you can see in this output. So all of these grid cells are a 30 meter grid cell. And I classified each one as low, medium, or tall based on their mean canopy height given by the drone. So in these images, you can see an example of what a low open habitat would look like and a medium, which is about one to two and a half meters. And then we consider anything over two and a half meters to be tall. I then used the Shannon Diversity Index to define our structural diversity. So this index typically uses species diversity, um, but I substituted the species for the structure height classes. I then used the distribution of these structure classes across a territory to calculate one value per territory, which is going to be that structural diversity number. Um, so you can see that a lower number means it's more homogeneous. So for example, this Shannon index of 0.2 over here in this territory, you can tell that it has mostly that low structure, whereas over here it has a higher number. So it has a more diverse structure. So it means it has more of those different categories. You can also see on this map in some instances, for example, here, we do have some gaps in the drone data. Um, that just means that we weren't able to get LIDAR imagery that was good enough to capture those height metrics. So to deal with this, I did a territory size correlation between what we measure in the field for J territory size versus what the drone measured. And it had a very strong, significant correlation. So we were satisfied with using the drone territory size as a replacement for the field measured size when I did all my analyses. I also ground truth the drone. So I went out and physically measured 120 random points. I measured the maximum height of the vegetation within that grid. And then we compared that to the maximum canopy height that the drone measured. And this was conducted on a five meter grid. So it was a lot smaller scale. And again, we were very happy with this strong correlation and significant relationship between what the drone measured and what I measured. So to be able to compare Archbold's fire metrics with that structural diversity data, these are the fire metrics that I looked at. So time since fire is basically the time and months since that area has experienced a fire event. Fire patches is the number of fires that that area experienced that does not include any overlapping sections. Whereas the next two metrics, number of fires and fire returnable, take into account the entire fire history. So number of fires does include overlap and it is the count of every single fire that that area has historically encountered. And fire return interval is the amount of time between each fire event. So to get into my results for those first couple questions, there was no significant relationship between fire, any fire metric, and structural diversity. So as you can see, these first two that don't take into account fire history, there was no significant relationship, and neither were, was there a relationship between those fire metrics that take into account fire history. The number of fires was significantly related to territory size. So as the territories get bigger, they experience a higher number of fires. And as territory size increases, you also experience more fire patches. So you would think that those two metrics would lead to more structural diversity. But as you can see here, um, it did not. <laughs> so territory size was not related at all with um, structural diversity. So that just goes to show that using these fire metrics has not been an accurate surrogate to describe structure. So to jump back to those first two research questions, um, we didn't find, so more fires and fire patches did not lead to a higher structural diversity and that structural diversity did not correlate with time since fire or fire return intervals. And larger territories did mean that they experienced more fire patches, but it did not mean that they experienced greater structural variation. 
So now we'll get into this third question, looking at how this habitat structure influences the behavior of Florida scrub jays. Predicting that jays will prefer medium vegetation and avoid tall and low, but they may prefer this low and tall vegetation for certain behaviors. For example, using tall structure for sentinel or lower structure for foraging. So you may wonder, how do you find out how jays use habitat structure? The answer is that you follow them around for a long time. <laughs> so I spent almost 70 hours following these jays around. I did one hour focal watches on breeder males and I conducted these focal watches during different phases of their nesting cycle to see if that had any influence on how they use structure. Um, so to describe some of these jay behaviors for those that may not be as familiar with birds, um, foraging is when they're on the ground or in some trees like actively looking for food. Sentinel is when they are perched usually higher and they're able to scan for predators. So scrub jays have a coordinated sentinel system where one jay is perched high scanning for predators and kind of watching out for its whole family while the rest of the family members are down foraging and they trade off. So they take turns taking this position. Some of these other buttons are for territory defense. Um, the OS is when they were out of sight and I wasn't sure what they were doing. And predator avoidance is usually when a hawk flew over, they would dive down low and kind of hide. <laughs> so during these focal watches, I used this really fancy data timer so I was able to continuously um, watch the birds with my binoculars and also keep notes on an iPad. So when the bird would start foraging, I could click this foraging button and it would start a timer. And then if the bird switched activities, I could click the other activity button and it would simultaneously start this timer while pausing this one. So at the end, I was able to get an entire Excel sheet that had each timestamp and length of duration that they did each of these activities. But at the same time, I'm recording their location of each activity in um, ArcGIS field maps app. <clears throat> so this is another example of how technology has advanced to help out our studies. Um, so I was able to use accurate location data rather than using paper maps as historic studies have done and having to estimate their location. So every time I would hit one of these um, activity buttons, I would also drop a pin over here and it would record the location and I could then use this drop down menu to select a behavior value. So then I was able to link up both of these data and overlay them onto the drone data. So each behavior over here is on a 10 meter buffer and I was able to calculate um, the mean canopy height for each of those buffers as well. So I can get, um, so I can classify each cell for the behavior as low, medium, or high. Um, so this is a zoomed in image of one territory where you can see the different colors represent those different behavior classes. So this is a good representation also of the fact that they spend about 90% of their time between the two main behaviors, which is foraging and sentinel. <clears throat> so to jump into my results for the habitat use study, we have these two different graphs. Um, so this is the proportion of their habitat structures that they had available. And then on the right is the proportion that they actually used. So it's divided by low, medium, and tall structure based on that canopy height. And these letters above here represent which um, structures had, were similar and which ones were different. So if they share the same letter, they are not statistically different from one another. But as you can see, if they have different letters, they are statistically different. So for the available, they have more low and medium available when compared to tall. And then over here in the used graph, you can see that they used low and medium significantly more than tall. And these two graphs are on the same scale. So you can also see that they used tall at a higher rate than they had it available. 
which leads us into um, seeing if they had selection for these habitat structures. So I ran a compositional analysis of habitat use. So this uses that proportional data from those previous graphs of all of my observations combined, and it tests for a significant selection of habitat structures. So overall, we got a p-value of 0.07, which isn't quite significant um, overall but it did show a significant selection for medium. So we can look here at a, I ran a Manly resource selection test. So this shows you again, the same letters report means the same thing. So if they share a letter, they're not different, but if they have a different letter, they are significantly different from one another. So you can see here that they avoid low. Um, so this line at the one, represents that there's no difference between use and availability. So anything below the line, um, we consider it to be avoidance and anything above the line is preference. So they are selecting for those structures. Um, so the compositional analysis gave a significant selection for medium because of this narrow confidence interval. Whereas they are also shown to be selecting for tall structure, but they have very large confidence interval here. So you can see that they do occasionally avoid for tall. And then we wanted to break this down and see how this selection differed for those main behaviors that they use. So I focused on that sentinel and foraging behavior. So for sentinel, um, you can see again that they select for medium and tall and are avoiding low. Um, but again, we have these smaller confidence intervals here and a larger confidence interval here. But this does make sense ecologically because when you're on Sentinel, you want to be perched high up so you can see further and scan for predators more easily. And then for foraging, they are selecting for medium and avoiding for tall and low. So to jump back to that last research question, looking at if the habitat structure influence behavior activities, we can see that the Js overall prefer medium and tall structure and typically avoid the low. And they do prefer tall for sentinel and that medium for foraging. So to summarize, um, overall fire did not influence measures of structural diversity in this study by using the Shannon Index to define structural diversity. Territory size did matter for some of the fire metrics, but it's not for the amount of structural diversity. And Jays did select medium structure for foraging, tall for sentinel. They are using the low and medium more often, but they are selecting the tall at a higher rate. So to put this in a bigger picture, um, as I mentioned before, due to habitat loss and fragmentation, these jays are reliant on conservation and management, um, specifically by fire. So fire managers um, can consider these structural preferences by the jays, what we learned from the study, when planning prescribed fires in the future. So they can attempt to not burn on such a large landscape an intense fire that would leave a jay territory with complete homogeneously low territory um, structure variation, but instead to try to create patchy burns so they can retain some of that medium and tall structure, which we know that the scrub jays rely on for those behaviors that make up most of their time. And also that the drone um, is, was a pretty awesome thing to capture. So it can capture about 50 ecological metrics after only being flown one time. And so that can be broadly applicable to many other studies or taxa. So we can take the data that I gathered from this study and apply it to other studies um, for a variety of taxa that also share this same system. <clears throat> it is important to continue to collect more of this post-fire data using the drones. Um, that way land managers can develop better structural predictions the more data you have, the more information you have, and you can always gain more from more information. So um, 
how J's use different structure is also likely based on context. So we know that they use the tall, but we also know that they abandon if there's too much tall. Um, so it's also possible that, you know, as J's are on sentinel, they could be sentineling on the edge of a tall patch while the rest of their family is utilizing more of that low vegetation. Or they might be foraging in low, but it is adjacent to a medium or taller patch. Um, so the scale of this drone study may not pick up on those smaller scales of patch use. So we, um, they might still be using that low, which we know that they do use. Uh, it just might not be on a scale of a 30 meter patch. So it's important to also possibly look at processing this drone to a finer scale to pick up on those different patch uses. And we can explore alternate ways to describe structural diversity, um, such as the spatial arrangement or size of those patches. And to just put this all into a broader context, all of this information can go back to land managers to help better create um, prescribed fires that can create a structure that is beneficial to these scrub jays which we know are an umbrella species. So by creating the structure that they prefer, you're also benefiting a bunch of other species that share those same habitat requirements. Um, so with that, I am happy to take any questions. Thank you. All right, that was awesome. I, it's mind boggling how much technology has changed, <laughs> like yeah. even in just the last five years and those maps that you showed with the vegetation that was nuts like I can't even imagine how many hours you would have spent had you had to do all that by hand yeah it was a <laughs> lot of data to work with <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome um so that was awesome that was very interesting so I just have one question um what was your what's your favorite story that you have from being out in the field and studying these Florida scrub jays do you have something <laughs> that sticks out in your mind Favorite story. Um, probably the funniest thing, I think, is maybe not my favorite story, but something that sticks out from doing these focal watches is just having to adapt to working in this hot environment. <laughs> so having to do these studies with advancements in technology does come with its issues. So I would have problems a lot where my iPad would overheat like halfway through a focal watch. So I'd have to stop and like find a small piece of shade, which is hard, hard to find, to like let the iPad recover. Um, but these Js are just so charismatic and each one has its own individual personality. So they have been really fun to work with and you kind of get to know them on an individual basis. And I don't want to say that I pick favorites, but I definitely have my favorite ones. And then my least favorite ones. <laughs> yeah, they're just, they're really funny birds. Um, they're, they can be sneaky when they want to. Sometimes you think you're watching them and then you look away for one second and you turn back and they're just <laughs> like, where did they go? <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Um, well, thank you so much for sharing the research that you did with Archbold Biological Station. I know um, that many of you are going to be watching the replay um, of this video. So thank you, Meredith. Thank you for all of you watching the replay. If you do have questions, um, we will be uploading this on YouTube. So feel free to leave a comment on the YouTube link and we will refer all those questions to Meredith so we can get the proper answers for you and let you guys know all of the information that you wanted to know. Um, Thank you again. Feel free to follow, follow Archbold Biological Station on social media, as well as South Florida Wildlife Center if you aren't following us already. Um, thank you guys so much and stay tuned for more updates from us, as well as future speakers that we have for our wild lecture series. Thank you so much, Meredith, and I hope you guys enjoyed the